Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokie Nation? Week one of the 2023 college football season is in the books, and the Virginia Tech Hokies are 1-0 for the first time under Brent Pry. Virginia Tech started a little slow in the first half, but picked things up in the third quarter to pull away with a 36-17 win over the Old Dominion Monarchs. Back in the win column where the Hokies belong, we'll break it all down for you. It's episode 308 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, and it starts right now. We record on Monday, September 4th, 2023 from Tech Sidelines High Tech Studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel and please share the podcast with a friend as well. Let's go ahead and get our introductions in order. On set, we have lead analyst and columnist Chris Coleman to my right. Across the way, senior staff writer Andy Bitter. In the fourth chair, managing editor David Cunningham. And producing behind the scenes, Mr. Nick Brown. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. Gentlemen, I'd like to begin today before we get into some questions and break this game down for everybody with a little bit of a game recap. So I guess I'll kind of take us through. It was slow out of the gate with the Hokies going three and out to start the ball game, followed by a promising drive that was cut short inside the five by a turnover on downs. After a quarter of play, Virginia Tech had a 2-0 lead over ODU following a gift of a safety where the long snapper Brock Walters sent it over the punter's head out of the back of the end zone. Virginia Tech picked it up at the end of the first half into the second quarter with a 10-play, 55-yard scoring drive. On the first play of the second quarter, Grant Wells found Middle Tennessee transfer Jalen Lane over the middle in a 20-yard pitch and catch for the touchdown. ODU would then respond with their best drive of the ball game, going 83 yards on 12 plays for a score. A couple series later, Virginia Tech scored their second touchdown of the quarter on a promising eight-play, 62-yard drive that consisted of a few explosive plays, a 34-yard dart down the left sideline to Jalen Lane that set the Hokies within striking distance for an Ollie Jennings touchdown in the back right corner of the end zone. After an ODU field goal, the Hokies went into the locker room with a slim 16-10 lead. We'll get the second half in just a moment, but first, as always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. Check out their new Checking with Perks account that comes with cell phone protection, roadside assistance, fuel savings, deals and discounts, and more. Visit firstbank.com to learn about this great new account for students. Now we take you to the second half on the first drive of of half number two, ODU fumbled, and the Hokies took over with solid field position. Tech went 69 yards in six plays that resulted in Ali Jennings' second touchdown of the ball game. ODU then responded with a long scoring drive for a touchdown as well before Tech went on another scoring drive of their own that saw Grant Wells sneak it up the middle into the end zone from one yard out. Tech forced another turnover, recovering a fumble and kicked a field goal a few drives later. The ensuing drive, Dorian Strong intercepted Grant Wilson of ODU, setting the Hokies up with first and goal from the nine. Virginia Tech would stall out then offensively on third down. Wells kind of missed Ollie Jennings open in the end zone and was forced to settle for a field goal. Tucker Holloway showed some explosive playability with a big-time 66-yard punt return, and Tech needed out in the red zone for the 36-17 victory. Fellas, I want to start by focusing on the positive here. And again, we went through the recap for those that maybe didn't get a chance to see every bit of the game. So we'll talk about some positives, then we'll talk about some things that maybe needed a little bit of improvement. But first and foremost... The three transfer receivers, Ollie Jennings, Jalen Lane, and Quan Felton combined for 203 yards and three touchdowns. I'd have to say they look pretty darn good out there. Yeah, I think uh, they made their presence felt. Uh, 
you know, Felton only had one catch, but he broke a tackle and it was one for 34 yards. The other two guys both combined for uh, three touchdowns and, and, you know, had good games overall. And, and, you know, Lane also had a good, good punt return for 14 yards. So that's what you wanted. Um, I, I think, uh, I think last year Grant Wells needed help and he only got it from one guy. And this year he's got it from three guys, maybe more guys as the, as the season goes along. But I, I think that that's what you wanted from those three guys to start. Yeah, those three and, uh, you know, Daywan Lofton had a nice catch of the ball behind his, the, that was behind him, a third down catch to move the sticks early, uh, complete some passes, Stephen Gaznell too. So just more weapons in that passing game altogether. But you look at some of the catches and it wasn't like, uh, you know, these were just like schemed open. Sure. Like Jalen Lane went up to make a 50-50 catch. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of, sort of the first big catch to get things going. Uh, the touchdown was just a nice design play, but you know they hit Jennings in the corner for the touchdown. That was a nice catch that he was. made in the corner. Taquan Felton caught it, slipped a guy, got up the sideline for another twenty yards. These are just plays that were not being made consistently by the receiving crew last year. This year, you have three, four, five maybe guys that can do that. I mean, it really reshapes this offense. It gives us, uh, you know, some dynamicness to it. Yeah, I think I saw two things that I wanted to see. I saw a few occasions of Tex receivers, you know, being schemed open to a certain extent, and then I also see saw them make plays. So. You left a few plays out there. Wells overthrew a couple, and then there were three drops. And most of that, though, was in the first quarter. And after that, it was pretty much smooth sailing after that. Yeah, it was funny, too. Uh, Jalen Lane and the beginning portion of that drive that set up the Ollie Jennings touchdown, they both went up and over the same corner. Mm. It was Taj Rael for ODU, and, uh, you know, we were kind of saying in the boots, kind of kind of mossed them both times. <laughs> um, so that was cool to see. Well, it's I- interesting because you can see what a different quarterback Grant Wells is when he has some guys that throw to it. It's like, yeah, you improved the, the receiver room, but now you've improved the quarterback room too because you've given this guy some confidence and some players – he can go. It doesn't need to be perfect. You know, the players need to be perfect for them to make a play on it. I can put it out there and have some trust that these guys will go up and make the catch and, and get some yards out of it. Yeah, he wasn't hesitant. You know, as the season wore on last year, I think he got more and more hesitant. And uh, just and that's from a lack of confidence. And he seemed very confident. And I expect those guys were making plays for him in practice in the preseason. And that just leads to uh, more and more confidence. And he, I think he's, well, before last night's Florida State game, he was number one in QBR for <coughs> ACC quarterbacks th- this week. Um, but I'm sure Jordan Travis eclipsed that last night. A little bit different playing LSU versus playing Slightly ODU, Slightly different, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Antoine Powell Ryland, APR, as they call him now, was a monster in his debut. He led the team with six tackles, had two sacks, and a forced fumble as well. Did you foresee him having that kind of an impact right away, right from the get-go? I thought Virginia Tech had a big advantage in the passing game. I, I headed into it. I, I thought they would be able to get pressure. ODU's offensive line only returned two starters, and those two guys weren't very good to begin with. Their tackles were inexperienced. And I thought Tech's corners would completely shut down the wide receivers. So I, th- I thought in situations where the Hokies knew knew ODU was going to pass, they'd be able to tee off, and, and that was the case. You don't, like, predict individual players to have X number of sacks or anything like that, but I'm not surprised the Hokies had five. I think they should have had six. Mario Kendricks uh, made, made a tackle, well, flushed the quarterback and made a tackle. It was about a half a yard loss on one play, but I think they eventually, they actually ruled it a no gain, so officially it wasn't a sack, but he did tackle him slightly behind the line of scrimmage. Well, if it's no not a full yard, then you don't technically right. lose that yard, yeah. so it wouldn't be a sack. Also, APR should have had another one, but he forced the fumble on that play, so it's not a sack, I guess. If somebody else recovered the ball, uh, mm. the quarterback fumbled it because he had two like legit sacks, and then that like half sack where the ball was fumbled forward, and, and the uh, offensive lineman jumped on it. So briefly, he had two and a half sacks in the schedule. But I did, I did predict he'd get to ten this year. So I'm feeling good about that prediction. That's, so far. That's, That's holding me. He was almost twenty five percent of the way <laughs> He's there. Twenty for twenty four. Yeah, there yeah. we go. So good prediction on my part. <laughs> Pretty strong out of the gate. Well, kind of piggybacking off of Chris's point. How about the pass coverage? Really outstanding on Saturday night. They were all over. Yeah. Uh, in fact, let me pull up my tweet from yesterday and this. This is specifically related to the corners. Which Brent Pry liked. Brent right? Pry yes, did like this tweet. <laughs> Old Dominion targeted uh, Mansoor, Delane, and Dorian Strong eight times, and they completed one pass for six yards. Strong returned his interception 32 yards. That means that the Hokie defense actually outgained the ODU offense when the Monarchs targeted VT's corners. Wow. So I, th- I think that says it all right there about that, that matchup. Virginia Tech took Old Dominion's best receiver, and ODU was not able to adequately replace him. So you, you just saw the, the 
the passing script flipped from one year to the to the next in this game. They even had Monster playing a little bit of safety. A Man, of times. You, you saw those guys cross training it, it, uh, a lot d- during the season. Uh, so you know, I, th- I think overall you've got to be pleased with pretty much every aspect of pass coverage and and pass rush from from Saturday yeah you night. you lose Stroman to the targeting penalty right before First halftime time, so right. you got to have uh a little bit of uh switching around there in the mm-hmm. secondary rather than bringing in really young guys for the whole time uh to back him up so th- yeah that positional versatility really comes in handy worth mentioning and updating everybody if you don't know so Stroman's going to be a-okay to play in the next ball game but because uh Feldarius Payne was ejected for targeting in the second half he will be inactive for the first half of the Purdue game on I, Saturday I felt bad for him because you know he missed all of last yeah. year with an injury and then four plays into his first game back boom targeting I know. and they for, were out to get people for targeting for hitting the, the chair like that you just got flagged for exactly. targeting. we're actually going to review no, it here I, for a couple minutes no the, the the targeting call that the uh that the deep official made uh where it was like nowhere close to hitting the, the caleb woodson hit. one yes where he just like yeah. slung him down yeah like not only is it not targeting it's also not a personal foul it's like, <laughs> right. I, it's like what are you guys what? watching you guys just have an itchy trigger figure with this it, stuff today. I, I i think it's clear like every year there's a point of emphasis and it although it wasn't announced or anything it kind of seems like it uh it was a point of emphasis. And it, it felt like those officials must have been watching like a hype video for targeting yeah, I, calls I, before the game. You like, know, just the, like, we're going to get them this time. <laughs> and, and remember all the rules changes this year. You're expecting the game to be sped up and everything. And then there's five targeting reviews and it takes all that well, away. Well, the uh, Louisville Georgia Tech one had like two calls, I think, in the first drive. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, okay, this is ridiculous. Yeah. We need to ease it back a and here's bit. the thing it's for player safety and everything like that and i'm all for player safety but how many years have we been doing targeting now is it really helping it's taking the egregious hits out of the game like what whenever they show like the 90s miami hurricanes so like all, all the greatest <laughs> yeah, hits, it's like every one of these guys would be ejected for targeted now yeah. like that, yeah. that hit is out of the game but now yeah. there's stuff that's like you're in a pile, and the helmet comes in a little bit low, and it g- glances and, the head. They're like and, that's targeting. And, by the and both guys like, are changing directions now. at the same time. Like the, right. the game, the game goes too fast to make those calls. There's no way a player can can react that quickly. Like I, I, I did think the the pain one was a really really tough call um, because you're you're in a really short amount of space. And you're taught to get low, but you don't necessarily have time to get completely low in a situation. And like he that. really didn't blast him. He didn't by blast any him. means. Yeah, um, I thought the other ones. I was surprised that their guy, um, their stud linebacker Henderson, Henderson. Mm-hmm. who's a second team All American, first team All Sun Belt last year. By the way, he led the nation in tackles with 186. The guy that had second in tackles had 39 less tackles than him last year. You know, uh, we, we did a, we're doing a series this year called Ask the Back Judge by uh, Tristan Reich, who, who's, a, who's an official, and uh, he does high school games, and he's also done lower-level lo- lower uh, college games. And he texted me during the game. He's like, don't ask me to review targeting calls because there's no rhyme or reason to the calls these guys are making, and that's coming from an official wow. yeah, himself. You spin the wheel of targeting every yeah. time he goes to the booth. David's got something for us. Yeah, well, I think this is a good point, uh, good time to bring up this question. Um, Double D's, this uh, one of our subscribers asked asked this question, and Andy, I know you're a hockey guy. Mm. Um, kind of. I'm from Minnesota. You're from Minnesota. <laughs> You've watched know. more hockey than probably most of us. I guess they moved the North Stars to Dallas, and I'm like, all right, this is kind of somebody. Uh, he asked, "What what would you feel if targeting was similar to hockey, where?" You were ejected for a quarter, and then you came back in to the game. I think all sports should have a penalty box. I think that'd be a great addition to. That's like, fantastic. Like that'd be a mad, That'd be great. Like stack the guys up there. They get the, you know, fifteen minute penalty. They come out and they're rearing to go. That'd be great. You, you could even have a sponsor for it and make more TV money. <laughs> there you go. Phil Arius Payne heads to the 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 FedEx penalty box or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I would I would love to see it. No, it's I I, a great I think. Idea. You know, failing that degrees of targeting or like, yeah. like, oh, that one was egregious. You were ejected. That one was not egregious. 
maybe just sit out a quarter or something like that. Like, you know, I, I, like I, I, the ejection and but, then the, did they have to leave the field still? I, I forget. No, what the, 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 I don't think they have to leave the field. Yeah, they, okay. they, 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 they get their the helmet of shame taken. anymore. Yeah. They, they used get to, their to like taken. march, like, you know, march them off the field and <laughs> like a strength coach would have to escort them back. And, or if they missed the first half, they'd be standing at the entrance. Like it's the Royal rumble or something like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> the second half. like it's just ridiculous. <laughs> well, last year tech was penalized 15 times against ODU and those struggles really continued throughout the 2022 season besides a pair of targeting ejections you know tech played an incredibly clean football game to open the season just four penalties all night you had those numbers in your article yeah i mean they had a an offsides penalty and then there was a delay game late and i don't really know what happened it looked like they got a play call change in late wells was they were really yelling at the sideline after yeah they were trying to change i don't think the yeah. communication was great yeah. i might even put that one on the coaches so uh i mean last year it was penalty after penalty after penalty and then even on that game winning drive that odu had last year the interference calls that extended that thing none of that in this game procedure was pretty clean in terms of the snap count and everything so uh, you look at year over year and how they played in this one specific game against ODU, a uh, much better game overall. Well, we, we saw Brett Pry literally kick a player off the field in the preseason for uh, for some uh, unscrupulous behavior. And we didn't see a lot of practice. Maybe he did it to other players, too. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. Fair to say it's a tough ask to, you know, ask to only be penalized four times the rest of the season, mm-hmm. two of them being targeting, so kind of fluky plays. Like, I, I, I don't know that that happens week in and week out. What do you think of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to vary. I mean, I'm sure even the best teams out there have one or two weeks where you're like too many penalties, right? But uh, it, it was kind of a Virginia Tech's ex, uh, for, for some teams, maybe like eight or nine penalties is extreme. For Virginia Tech, it was like 15. Right. Well, I mean, it's penalties of aggression you can live with. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, did you, you know, was it a late hit? Sometimes you're just going too hard at a guy. You don't want late hits like that. They're egregious. But like holding, you're going to have that against bigger, faster opponents. Sometimes you just uh, default to that kind of thing. Interference, you'll try to make a play on the ball. But what you want to avoid is the procedure stuff because yeah. that's like, you know, day one stuff like snap count. Like snap count's a big deal. You can't have ten false start penalties in the game or whatever it was against <laughs> NC State. I mean, that's just that's just a sign of a team that was not well coached at that point last year. And this year they didn't have any of that. So, you know, maybe they're doing better on that front. Well, I was impressed with the pass protection of the offensive line. Now, with that being said, uh, Old Dominion's best edge rusher, Amori Morrison, was ejected three plays into the game on targeting. And their D line is undersized compared to anything that Virginia Tech will see in the ACC, but I thought they kept the quarterback pretty clean. Yeah, ODU does not, you know, pr- obviously present dynamic athleticism up front from a pass rush standpoint. But at the same time, there were times last year where the offensive line I thought was pretty dysfunctional in pass protection, particularly down the stretch. And you didn't see any of that. I thought they were a brick wall on Saturday night. Uh, I, I, PFF credits ODU with two pressures the entire game. And one of those, Wells escaped in the backfield and almost ran in for, for a touchdown. How there was, there was one play where Bashal Tootin like picked up two blitzers mm-hmm. at the same time. I forget who, who posted that on Twitter. I missed that during the game, but yeah, I think group effort, uh, mm-hmm. offensive line and the backs, uh, you know, keeping Grant Wells pretty clean back there. There was that one play where Grant rolled out to the right and he almost hit. I think it was Felton in the end zone, and they were kind of calling for pass interference. And I was like, man, if Felton caught that, it would have been like. 35-yard touchdown pass, Wells off his back foot. I was like, that would have been the best highlight we've seen in like 18 months. I thought the best throw of the game, or the best play, not necessarily the best throw, the best play of the game was the pass over the middle to Benji Gosnell. Mm. It was Tripp's formation to the left, and and Wells looked left at first and and got the ODU defense moving in that direction and then then hit Gosnell over the middle. I thought that was a well-designed and well-executed play. No doubt about it. Well, you know, Tech showed some big playability. Five plays of 20-plus yards, all of which by newcomers. Kind of piggybacking off the conversation of the receivers that we had earlier. Just how refreshing is that? Yeah, I I think the stat I saw, uh, they had 12 pass plays of 30 or more yards last year. They had three. uh, One by each of the new receivers, which is a nice little symmetry uh, to put in the story there. But it just shows that they have some playmakers this year. That, you know, for as much as you want to say, ah, the quarterback struggled last year and, you know, it wasn't great, you have to have people to throw to. You have to have people that can get open. Uh, you know, the running game struggled. Yeah, but y- if you have these receivers that are getting down the field and getting open, it's going to open that up on the ground too. So it all goes together. And I think it's just, 
they've added talent significantly to this offense, and it showed up in week one. I think a lot of quarterbacks, maybe even most quarterbacks, it's about the situation for them. I mean, you look at Brennan Armstrong in 2021, and he's one of the best quarterbacks in the country. And in 2022, he throws seven touchdowns with 12 interceptions. He goes from being one of the best to one of the worst in one year, and it's not because he got worse as a football player. He's at NC State now, and he played much better on Thursday night, but NC State lacks playmakers. Like, they lack wide receiver and and running back talent. So, and just watching that game, he made some throws that his receivers just did not come down with. Um, And he kind of willed them to win with his legs in that game. Um, But it's one of those things where – I'm looking ahead here, of course, but like I look at it like NC State, that game's in, in Blacksburg, and Brennan Armstrong's really good, but they don't look like they have the skill position talent. And at least they didn't against UConn, unless UConn has some kind of you know studly secondary that I, I don't know about. <laughs> well, I mean, if they're short on skill positions, they can always throw it out wide to the offensive tackle. That's if true. He's open. That, that, that so. is a good backup plan. Brennan Armstrong reunited with Robert and I now at NC State, who was his OC at Virginia. So we'll see how that kind of continues to shake out. Still a little hurt that he left Syracuse to Mm -hmm. go to NC State, but... It well, happens. y'all scored sixty some this week. Yeah, we did score sixty five. That's Colgate, and we took well, we took a nice quarterback coach that he brought with him from UVA, Jason Beck. Uh huh. So Let's play the toothpaste team. Yeah, <laughs> it was nice. It was nice. We'll take a sixty five nothing win, no doubt. We'll take a thirty six seventeen win as well, though. Tech was plus three in turnovers on Saturday night, the best since twenty twenty at Louisville. Uh, last year, Tech gave up five turnovers, including, including four Grant Wells interceptions against Old Dominion. Creating turnovers was an emphasis in the offseason. Tech displayed that on Saturday night, and the offense took really good care of the football as well without a single giveaway. Yeah, uh, it's you know a 19-point win. What if the turnover margin is the opposite direction? You know, and, and I think, uh, obviously, that was the big difference in last year's game. It took five turnovers and a couple of fluky play, plays for ODU to win the game by three points. And, uh, and this year, uh, it was the other way around, three turnovers in Tech's favor. And that game could have been worse. You know, Tech got stopped at the one-yard line. They, they need the ball down inside the 10-yard line to end the game. So it was their first game since uh, 2021 scoring 30 points, but you know, they could have scored 40. And if everything had come together, absolutely everything had come together, potentially 50. Yeah. And I look back at, uh, I forget what the score was when canteen caused that fumble. I That's feel like it was still question. pretty that was, tight. At it that was, point. it was, 10, it was 1610 because it was the first possession in the second half. Okay. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's a close game. Yeah, yeah. ODU's got the ball, could even take the lead there uh, coming down, force the fumble at midfield. Virginia Tech goes down and scores, give you some breathing room. I mean, that that's a huge play. Uh, you know, good to see Dorian Strong get a pick. Uh, I think his last one was BC in 2021. Mm hmm. Uh, he had a better return this time because at BC, he took it out of the end zone and fumbled and turned it right back over to Boston <laughs> right. College. This one, he takes it back 32 yards, almost scored uh, on the play. You're right. I mean, we talk about what the final score is. People are like, oh, it was okay, okay. I mean, they punch either of those two touchdowns in at the end when they're inside the 10-yard line or, you know, Wells got stuffed on the, you know, tried to go over the top yeah. on the fourth and two or fourth and one, whatever it was, did not go well. Uh, you know, they had three opportunities there at the end. They could have really extended this thing further. And you're not talking about like, oh, it was an okay win. I mean, you're talking about 20-plus point win, and you feel a lot better about it. Well, I thought we saw some flashes from the Young Bucks as well. Hard-hitting Mose Phillips played quite a bit at safety, and he really did lay a couple of nice hits. Um, Aiden Green saw some snaps at wide receiver. Braylon Johnson and Dante Lovett saw the field as well. Anything that stood out to you? I want to say uh, Mose Phillips was out there for 23 snaps, maybe something like that. Uh, you know, is a physical presence. Uh, didn't grade very well. Uh, has to clean up the run fits. Uh, you know, the, the, the linebackers and safeties were on an island to a certain extent in the run game. And you could see, like, Nasir, Nasir Peoples played very well. He handled it well because he's experienced. Jalen Stroman played very well. He handled it well because he's got experience. Um, the other two safeties didn't really handle it very well. And they had to play more because Stroman only lasted 19 snaps. So that was part of it. Um, I, so I liked what I saw from those starting safeties. I thought it was good for the backups to get that game experience against a team that, while not very talented, they challenge you schematically with the way they spread the field, and it, and it makes things tough on, on the safeties. Uh, so 
from a schematic standpoint, things will be easier from for those guys for, from here on out. But it's good to get their feet wet in a game that Virginia Tech wins by 19 points. Yeah, I think those guys are high enough on the depth chart that they're going to need to play this year. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to be able to go four games, then sit them down. Like that's just not going to happen, right. especially if you don't want to. You know, last year with the offensive line, you're like, okay, this season's not going well to begin with. Let's not compound the issue by wasting a year with some of these guys. I think these guys are going to have to play, especially if there's an injury at some point or an ejection. Like you happened the know. other day. I mean, all of a sudden you're like, well, safety is the one position where it gets really young, really quick. We can't lose a guy there. And then Jalen Stroma gets hurt and, uh, you know, they have to, you know, push up guys up the depth chart there. So, uh, you know, I think Aiden Green, I think he's going to play this year. Caleb Woodson, he's going to play this year. Corn, couple cornerbacks, absolutely going to play. And Moe's Phillips, I mean, I think those guys are, they're committed to getting them in the game and they're probably going to burn the red shirt this year. I would say the, the one guy listed in the two deep, as a true freshman that will probably redshirt, I would guess would be uh Penix. Like he's listed as the backup nickel. Yeah, he's probably right. number number six of yeah. the cornerbacks. Yeah. yeah. And, and you I, could, you could get away with five, but again, an injury happens and yeah. all of a sudden that changes the equation. What about Xavier and Turner Bradshaw? You think we see him at all? I, I was a little bit surprised that that you didn't see any of him the the other night, but uh, especially considering the reviews he got. And, uh, you know, Brent Pry in one of his preseason interviews actually mentioned him before Dewan Lofton, but then it was Lofton who got into the game. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that'll vary on a week-to-week basis, but we'll see him at some point, I believe. Before we send it over to the fourth chair with David, this episode is also brought to you by Coldwell Banker Townside Realtors. Are you in the market to purchase or sell a residential property? Are you looking for land or investment property in Southwest Virginia? We have you covered with three offices in the area. Visit cbtownside.com to learn more. David, anything in the fourth chair from you on the positive note for the Hokies on Saturday? Yeah, well, I think it was a it was a big recruiting weekend for everybody. I I think some people might overestimate you you know your your everyday fan might overestimate how much a weekend like this and a night game in Lane Stadium means for everybody at Virginia Tech. Um, it's an opportunity for the Hokies to show off Lane Stadium on national television. As Will tweeted out this morning, Metallica tweeted out the Enter Sandman mm-hmm. video from Saturday night. It's a night game. It's one of the best entrances, if not the best, in college football. And recruits for all sports, not just for football, buy into that. It is obviously a big rec- recruiting weekend for football. But men's basketball had two guys here, uh, Ryan Jones from uh, Gainesville and uh, Connie uh, Ruths from Bradenton, Florida. Um, I know women's basketball had one or two uh, visitors here. Um, I think wrestling had one or two. I think Jack Brizendine tweeted about that yesterday. Um, it's just a big recruiting weekend overall, and I think – it helps when the football team wins and is performing well and the fans stay and everybody's into it. Um, but outside of that, uh, two pickups in the last week, one men's basketball commit, one women's basketball commit, uh, Tyler Johnson, 6'5", um, six, 190-pound six, small forward from Orlando. He committed on Wednesday to men's basketball. He's Tech's um, first 2024 commit. On the women's side, Clara Silva from Portugal, 6'6 center, committed yesterday. Um, she's Tech's third 2024 commit. I do have a, a question, Chris, regarding PFF grading. Mm-hmm. What, do you know what the process is for that? Somebody, uh, uh, no, Hokie don't. 101 was asking kind of who does the grading and, and what they're looking for. Well, I mean, I don't think they're going to give up that information because they don't want somebody to copy their yeah. their product. Um I, I don't know the exact pr- pr- uh, process. I mean, obviously, PFF's not going to grade anybody or hire anybody that doesn't know anything about football. Um, I, I have talked to one of the a guy who used to work at, at PFF before, and he's explained a little bit of it to me, but that was several years ago, and it's just not in my head right now. Uh, and I'll say this about PFF. Like, you can nitpick things here and there, but generally speaking, those grades over the course of 12 games match the eye test. Yeah. Um, one other question I wanted to throw in there. We talk often, we have talked often about just the strength and conditioning stuff that occurred during the Fuente era. This is now entering year two of Brent Prize era. Chris, do you feel like the strength and conditioning issues are finally being addressed? Uh, SD Hokey asked that. I'm encouraged by what I've seen so far, but 
you know, strength and conditioning is a four year process, four or five year process. So uh, we'll be able to tell more as, as time goes by. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the guys you, you want to keep keep an eye on are the guys whose bodies need to significantly change. So like a guy like Dante Lovett, who's six foot, 190 pounds, who came in very physically advanced already, he's not going to change so much during the course of his career. But how much does Braylon Johnson's body change over the course of his career? He came in at 171 pounds. Uh, you know, how much... Uh, how much does Caleb Woodson's body change? He, he, he's got decent size already and a good frame, but he's still going to add weight and he can fill out more and get more muscular. So th- those are the guys you have to look for. Kelly Lawson, he's already put on 25 pounds since he's been here. You know, obviously he's got the frame to put on even more. So how much does his body continue to change? Uh, Lawson might be the guy who at the end of his career you look at as, as the ultimate judge of the tech strength and conditioning program because he came in so skinny, so raw, but with so much potential. And I, and I think they've done a really good job hit with him so far and, uh, you know, give it another couple of years and he'll really look the part. I'll say on the recruiting front, I'm a little disappointed. The pride didn't arrive in a helicopter on Saturday. It's like, <laughs> well, sat down in the we, middle we, of the we field. Did, we did have a question like that. about the helicopter. Sure. I, I, well, that's a good time to bring it up. Um, okie dokie. Hokey asked, uh, <laughs> What do we what what do you think of of the tactic? I mean, we knew we were told ahead of time that it was going to happen. Tech's flying fifteen minutes up the road, yeah, to Salem High School. You know, it is the number one recruit in, in the state. I, is that just how? Is that just where recruiting has evolved it's, to? It's perception. Uh, somebody told me over the weekend. I forget who told me this, but one time Kirby Smart took a chopper to visit a recruit who lived 10 minutes from Athens. I think yeah. I told you It's that. all about you showmanship. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. That's SEC exactly. coaches have been doing this for a while. Right. And it's not in tech. I'm not going to say whose helicopter it is. I know whose helicopter it is. Tech didn't rent the helicopter or pay any money for it. They probably paid the fuel for it. But but that, that, that helicopter was provided for, for them by a friend of the program. So it's not like they had to go out and rent it and spend a bunch of money on it or anything like that. It was just something they wanted to do just for perception, just to get it out there. Yeah, it's, it's all about the, the little film bite that you get out of it. I mean, mm-hmm. you can look pretty cool walking off a helicopter, especially where like the bomber glasses, like Fry <laughs> does getting off there. Like it, that's tough not to look cool on that. Like I'm sure I could manage to not look cool which, doing uh, that. But. Which wrestling pay-per-view way back in the day did Ric Flair show up in a helicopter? It was oh, like I don't know. The 80s. It was like in Charlotte. It was like Starcade or something like that. That sounds about that would have been WCW. Oh, it was before WCW, but oh, wow. it was, yeah, it was like Jim Crockett promotions or something. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I did. but yeah, he shows up. And they're they're actually it's like an outdoor stadium they're doing this event and he shows up and the helicopter lands right outside the arena and he walks from the helicopter to the ring. Yeah. Right. I mean <laughs> but when you land in the helicopter, like everybody in the area realizes that there's yeah. a helicopter landing, yeah. their eyes are gonna be, you know, fixed to it. So yeah, it, it garnered some attention and I don't know if it's gonna work to get Chris Cole. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are other factors in this whole recruitment and a lot of uh you know, major schools that are pursuing him with that. So I, I don't think if, if he goes somewhere else, it's like, oh my gosh, it's an utter failure that you didn't get him. I mean, a lot of people want him and a lot of people are putting a lot of resources into trying to get him, but you do the best you can. You go out there, you put on a show and this whole thing. And even if he doesn't commit, other recruits are looking at this and going, man, they're kind of going all out for these guys. This is, you know, it, ordinarily you maybe wouldn't even think of Virginia Tech in this situation, but now you are because of this whole helicopter stunt that they did. I don't know anything about Salem's underclassmen either, but let's say Salem's got a 2025 kid or 2026 kid that Virginia Tech is recruiting and and – they're going to think, man, Brent Pry came to my game in a helicopter one time. That'll be one of their initial impressions of, of recruiting. Sometimes it's like the the initial impressions that count more than what you do at the end. And even at Salem. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's out there on Twitter. It's out there on, on the news. Like, you know, other people see that. Hey, it's kind of interesting, at least, that a coach came there in a helicopter like that. So, decent move, I would say. I would say. Any updates, by the way, on when Chris Cole uh, plans to announce? Is that... And has he laid out any kind of timetable? The next week or so. Oh, wow. Oh, September 10th. 10th. Well, he said September 10th in, in, in one article, but he told Jason Stame for TSL, quote, something like this, but he said sometime between September 1st and September 10th. 
Hmm. That's coming well, up. That's what he told Jace. So yeah, it it's, is it's, the fourth. It's, it's very very close. All right. Interesting. All right, let's talk about some things that maybe we would have liked to see go a little bit differently or improvements heading into Purdue uh, that that took place on Saturday night. First and foremost, you know, I I personally would have liked to seen the Hokies score a little bit more. Andy, I know in our preview you said, like, look, let's just take a win where we can get it. But for me, it was particularly in the red zone and in the second half. Tech ran 60 plays in ODU territory and went 6 for 9 in the red zone, uh, which I will add was second to only Syracuse in the ACC this week. This was before the Florida State game was played, so I don't know how those numbers have changed. Um but two of those were field goals. So it just kind of felt like you could have had touchdowns a couple of times. Uh, you had that one where it was after the interception, Wells kind of threw it behind and over the head of Ollie Jennings. Jennings was open on a slant route right in the end zone. He Miscommunication, he missed him. Stuff like that. I was like, would have liked to see six there. Looked like it should have been a touchdown. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's some things you can clean up. Uh, ultimately, they scored more points than any of us picked in our in the game preview, I believe I picked him to score thirty four. I had thirty one. Right, and uh, I think Will had thirty one, if I remember correctly. Well, when you haven't scored thirty points in fourteen games, right, then, right, right, you know, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so go uh, here, and, and, and I, feel, 50. I feel good about it because I had him scoring thirty four, and the offense scored thirty four. You know, and the, and the special teams scored. Wow, two. yeah, that's actually yeah, yeah, yeah. Spot so, uh, but so like, I'm happy from that standpoint. And there were th- certain things I wanted to see in the game. That I, I said I wanted to see 60% completion rate. Well, they went 18 of 30, so that's right. Yeah, 50, is that 58%, so almost. Uh, and then you got uh, 30 points, which I wanted. Then I wanted four yards of carry. Did not get four yards mm-hmm. of carry. But I also did not expect them to hit on every single thing that I wanted to see in game one. If they had done that, then, yeah, they would have scored 50, and I don't think anybody was going to be out there ex- expecting them to score 50 points. Yeah, some of those uh, red zone struggles, I think it, it's tied to that, you know, not being able to run the ball mm-hmm. that well. Uh, did not really push ODU off the ball. Uh, not very imaginative with the play calling in the ground game. In the run game. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of runs up the middle. They were just like, okay, I think everybody saw that one coming there. Uh, but, yeah, if, if you run the ball better, then maybe you, you move the chains on, you know, two fourth downs, they turn the ball over, turn over on downs, I think. Because uh, that yep. first one, after they did the quarterback swap and they threw the incompletion of yep. fourth down from the two, and then Wells got stuffed on a fourth down run. That so they went one for three on one fourth for down. three on fourth downs, and it, you know, I wonder if at the end, if Brett Pry doesn't want to run it up on his friend on the other side, I wonder if that plays into it at all. Uh, I don't know about that, but you know, they they didn't run the ball well. And if you run the ball better, I think you move the ball better inside the red zone and give yourself more of a chance. Yeah, I think so. The, the running game kind of reminded me of like what I saw him do against Wofford last year when they, they they won the game with relative ease, but they kept trying to establish that inside run. Inside, 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 and they could never do it. And in that Wofford game, they kept going for it in short yardage situations, and Wofford was stuffing them. You know, and that was kind of a harbinger for things to come for the rest of the year. So you hope... It's not the same thing this year. You hope it improves from here on out. It did not improve l- last year until you could argue uh, the very end of the season, the Liberty game, and with a, with a brief reemergence when Malachi Thomas was healthy, but that wasn't for for very long. Um, the thing is, though, it is, it was more about blocking than anything else the other night. Um, Bishol Tutin forced ten missed tackles. Uh, to put that into perspective, there's only one running back in the country who's played one game this year with more forced missed tackles. And that's the uh, App State running back. And that was against Gardner Webb, an FCS team. Baishul Tutin forced a lot of missed tackles the other night. Unfortunately, when he forced one, there was another two defenders there. And it's hard to force three missed tackles on on one play. Uh, And it wasn't the first finger that gets pointed when the running game doesn't work was to the offensive line, of course. And the offensive line didn't play well in the run game. I don't think it was because they were dysfunctional, because if they were dysfunctional, it would have extended to the pass protection, too, probably to a certain extent, and that wasn't the case. I just didn't think they played well. Um, But it wasn't just the offensive line. Uh, The only player on the team that had a run-blocking grade above, like, 63 
was Ali Jennings at wide receiver, and he blocked well. Uh, over overall, the tight ends blocked poorly, and the receivers blocked poorly. There, there were a couple of times where Tootin did have room after he'd broken a tackle on the inside. He had room to break it to the outside, but there were for, there were hitters coming in from the outside that, that wide receivers or tight ends had failed to block. Um, so. Yeah, point the finger at the offensive line, but don't point it at the offensive line any harder than you point it at the tight ends and wide receivers because they had poor blocking games as well. Hey, you don't have Nick Gallo. I, I don't think he's a great blocker, but he's a veteran blocker. Sure. And you go from you know redshirt senior, whatever year Gallo is, COVID year senior, to second-year players for the all the tight ends. So I think that could uh, be a, a factor as well. Yeah, d- definitely. And and I will say, like like you said, I didn't think the run blocking scheme was, or, or the running game itself was particularly creative. It was, uh, to, draw, to use a quote from Brent Pry from last year, too easy to draw a bead on. Um, like, if I'm a defensive coordinator, like, I'm, I'm telling my linebackers and safeties, you know, if you read run, cheat to the inside. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's that's, that's too simple a, 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 a way to phrase it really but I'm trying to keep it simple here and that it just doesn't seem like anything's going outside the tackle box right so you can cheat a little bit on the tech running game I, I think uh, I th- and I, I think we'll get to the quarterback rotation later but even when you know Kyron Jones is in the game I'm telling my linebackers and safeties just pretend it's going to be a run and if it's a pass, I'll take the blame for it, right? Uh, that's what I'd be saying if I was a defensive coordinator. So I'd like to see more motion in the running game. Perhaps a jet sweep or two to, to, to get some defenders moving from uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's allowed side. anymore. Ah, man, I know. You went from a whole bunch of them to none at all. And, and it, it is a play that gets defenders' eyes moving, and, and it makes them hesitate slightly. So I feel like you've got to incorporate a little more motion, a little more misdirection into your running game to uh, make things a little bit more difficult on the on those defenders uh, when it comes to making their reads. It is funny that uh, – people's dislike of Fuente has made them hate a play that averaged like six yards a carry. Know, <laughs> like, like don't carry your hate over for the former coach to, to this <laughs> one play that actually was pretty successful. Yep. Is it a hate for Brad Cornelson or Justin Fuente or both? Both. It's, yeah. People don't discriminate. Sure. Between the <laughs> <laughs> it's over the top and it's, but it, yeah, people, football fans are going to be emotional like that. Yeah. Well, it's evident Chris has been doing this for a long time because he let us Beautifully into uh, our next topic of conversation. Can't believe it took this long to bring up the quarterbacks, but here we are. I personally was not super impressed with the two quarterback system. Seemed to actually take Virginia Tech out of their rhythm a little bit. They did not feature it in the second half. Brent Price said that they had talked about it on the headset, ended up holding off. Uh, In your opinion, what will this two quarterback system look like going forward? I think it, it could vary week by week early. Next week is Purdue, and they just lost at home to Fresno State. They did well against the run. They got bombed through the air. So to me, it does not make sense to play Kyron Drones uh, against uh, Purdue when they're susceptible to the passing game and not the running game. That seems like a Grant Wells show to me. Um, I think, you know, you, you want Drones in for to help you win the running game, but how much does it really help you when the defense is probably 90% certain it's going to be a run? Does it really help you? I don't think it helps you all that much. Yeah, I, I think it could just because drones does have the athleticism to make something out of nothing. But when three guys are dragged on them, it's tough to get yeah. anywhere. I just, I, I think you made the point. It, it kind of took things out of rhythm in mm-hmm. that second drive and, didn't quite know when guys were going in and out. And then it's like, okay, three plays for drones. Then, all right, Wells, it's your show for fourth and two. It's like, okay, well, just coming in cold to throw a fourth and two pass there. So uh, it's very strange. And then I thought it was strange that they didn't at least get drone some snaps at the end. Yeah. yeah they they were up 19 with four minutes left in the ball at midfield. It's like, that seems like if you want to get him used to playing and get him up to speed with stuff, that that would be a good time to get mm-hmm. him some actual snaps where it's not just like, you're only going to run it or they made a point to throw the pass on the first play. I Mm. think to be like, Hey, he can pass too. This Mm. is something that he does. He does. He has the whole playbook. We've said this many times, (laughs) so you have to prepare for that. So, um, I don't know. I've just felt like they were giving more lip service to this whole quarterback rotation, which maybe is a good thing because I don't think it's going to be something that they can pull off because very few teams ever pull it off. Yeah. And you know, I just kept hearing 
over and over that it was such a big advantage for, for Wells in the passing game. And when it comes down to it, like, does the advantage Kyron Drones may provide in the running game, does that, is that better than the advantage Grell's, Grant Wells provides in the passing game? I don't think so, personally. Wells had two, text two longest runs from scrimmage the other night, 10 yards and nine yards. Last year, he had the second most forced missed tackles on the entire team, right? So, uh, which I'm not, that's not saying much because the team didn't force many last year, but it's not like he's a slug back there. You know, it's, it's not like he has no running ability at all. Um, so I just, I think that's something that maybe it was probably a little bit of, of lip service. No, I do think that they believe in, in the drones has a high ceiling. And by giving him so many reps in the preseason, they were kind of hoping a light bulb would go on and it would become, it would turn into more of a competition than it actually was. But I don't think that ever really happened, even if they might say it did. Old Dominion ran the football for 201 yards on the Hokies. Is that something to worry about? <laughs> uh, yes. It's not great. It's not great. <laughs> um, not great considering, uh, you know, they struggled on offense and pretty much they, they, they had a good running back last year, Blake Watson, and he, he left and went to Memphis. They're, they're the top two running backs on their depth chart career under four yards per carry, both of them. And then, you know, they're gashing the Hokies the other night. And, and a quarterback who I doubt will rush for that many yards again in his entire career, you know, is just even with five sacks, you know, they, they, they even with five sacks, sacks and the big loss on, on the bad snap, they still rush for 201, 201, 201 yards. yards. That's not good. Some of that is the way they spread their wide, they stack their wide receivers so far towards the sideline. It pulls, pulls your safeties out. And Tech was playing a, their other safety back because I, I think they were really concerned about what those wide splits could do for the passing game. I think in hindsight, they, they might have done that. They might have gone a little more one-on-one -on, -one on the outside and played an extra safety to get that free hitter, and that would have helped. Um, but I, I think that I, I think they were they, they were more concerned about ODU hitting a deep ball or something or breaking a tackle on one-on-one -on -one coverage than, than they were about them sustaining drives with a running game, being able to drive the, the, the field on a consistent basis, which is probably correct, quite frankly. Like, well, I picked ODU to score 10, and I envisioned them hitting a big play somewhere in there for, for their touchdown. I didn't envision, envision them having a 12-play, 83-yard drive like, yeah. like, like, like they did in, in the game. All that said, the linebackers really struggled with their run fits. That's what I thought watching the game, and then the PFF grades back that up. Uh, in particular, uh, Tisdale, Keller, and uh, Kelly Lawson struggled. Will Johnson, who was kind of a surprise addition to the two deep when the depth chart came out, he was the highest grader on the team and played 22 snaps. I don't worry as much about Lawson because – he played very well for, for the Hokies down the stretch last year, graded out well, played consistent football. So it could be just a one-off for him against a tricky scheme that he hadn't seen before. It's a little more concerning with those other guys. Uh, Tisdale playing Mike, which is a position he's never played before until this game. And then Keller. Keller was a guy who, safety in high school, didn't play well at linebacker when called upon. And then when Tisdale came back, Keller immediately went to the bench. And now he gets a start this year at Mike, which again is a new position for him after playing Will last year, and he and he didn't play well. So he hasn't. We've yet to see him play well in, in, as a linebacker, really, in, in a tech uniform. So that's one to still keep your eye on. He's not a natural Mike. He's not a natural run stopping Mike. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing the defense lacks is a natural run stopping Mike. You can talk about Dax all you want in pass coverage. The and yeah, he gave up a few big plays last year. But in the end, you look at the numbers, he only gave up, I don't know if, how this compares to other middle linebackers, but he gave up about 340 passing yards last year per PFF when he was targeted. When it comes down to it, that's like 30 yards a game. you know. And I can guarantee you those two Mike linebackers the other night cost Virginia Tech more than 30 yards per game in the running game. The most important thing you can get at the Mike linebacker position is a run stuffer. And I'll always believe that. So they've got to get that sorted out. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't think Keller is like a natural run stuffer, but I'm also sick and tired of flip-flopping linebackers back and forth between different positions during the middle of the season like we saw last year. Uh, so well, that's just something to monitor going forward. But I think from a formation standpoint, uh, things will be easier on those guys going forward because I, I don't you won't see so many wide splits from wide receivers and those linebackers and safeties won't be isolated quite as much. Yeah, they're young. I mean, the, these guys essentially first-time starters. I know Lawson started some games late last season, uh, I believe, but how often do you break in two sort of brand-new linebackers at the exact same time? I think they just over-pursued sometimes, lost sight of the quarterback pulling it, and then all of a sudden he's running free open down the field. So and, you know, I don't want to come down too hard on the whole thing because sometimes it's just first game. You know, first game, get your feet wet. Uh, trying to figure things out but yeah a little distressing the team like ODU could run for that many yards because they're going to face much more challenging rushing offenses than ODU this year so didn't run the ball that well on offense didn't stop the run too well on defense those are two pretty big components of successful teams so they'll have to, to get that fixed before they get out there again well, my next question was about the linebackers. I think you guys took care of that one for me. So this year, 3304 Sports, our completely student-run sports media organization compiled of Virginia Tech sports media and analytics students, is attacking the 2023 football season with a brand new goal. Our mission is to cover all 12 Virginia Tech football games and an eventual bowl game to close out the season, but we need your help. Please consider donating to our GoFundMe page where your contributions will go towards covering travel costs for our student journalists this football season. So far, we've raised about $2,400 of our $10,000 goal. From hotels to transportation, every little bit helps. So please head over to techsideline.com or check out the link in the description to donate today. Fellas, anything else that you'd like to see cleaned up before we send it over to David uh, ahead of the Purdue game, who, like you mentioned, by the way, just lost to Fresno State in their season opener? Obviously, you know, the run game on both sides of the ball needs to get cleaned up. But that also that puts more pressure. If it doesn't get cleaned up, that puts more pressure on the Tech passing game. Um, I think if Virginia Tech had come out and what well, they rushed for 109 yards, I think if they had rushed for 209 yards, then there's – few miscues in the first quarter in the passing game, whether it be the overthrows by Wells or the drops by the wide receivers and or Daquan Wright, mostly. Um, I think that gets overlooked a lot more. I, I think you, you sit there and say, ah, oh, just a tough quarter. They're getting their feet under them. No big deal. Uh, if you rush for 209 yards and you end up scoring over 40 points and, and things like that. But if the running game doesn't work, it is more pressure on the passing game to not make mistakes. You know, like when there is an opportunity there, you can't overthrow him. When there's a third down catch to extend a drive, like the first drive of the game, and Jalen Lane dropped it, you have to make the catch, right? Well, because uh, the running game's not there for you. So uh, you talk about the running game's going to help the passing game. Uh, the passing game is going to have to help the running game, too. Yeah, I think just slow start. It's come out faster. I mean, you're going to have to play four quarters against tougher teams on the schedule. And, you know, I, I look back at that very first drive. They had a screen pass set up mm -hmm. that, man, did they connect on that. Yeah. I think it's going a long ways. And it's a little long from Wells. I don't know if it's adrenaline right away. You're, you're really you know, jacked to get out there. But uh, just that. And then the second drive, they had the quarterback swap. They don't score there. Uh, I think you need to capitalize earlier in games. That would help you out a little bit, especially when you play tougher opponents. David, was there anything Virginia Tech did on Saturday night that you guys weren't expecting or that surprised you? Hmm. I, w I wouldn't say so. Uh, I, w I thought, honestly, from the way they talked in, in the preseason, I thought we would see more Kyron drones. And even after the second drive, I think what he had five plays in that one drive, and I'm like, okay, we're going to see him we're going to see them more in this game. And then they didn't. So maybe that surprised me a little bit in the course of the game because they did come out with a lot of drones, you know, early. And, and But for the most part, uh, nah, not especially. Um, I expected a two running back rotation from the way they talked, and that's what we got. The only other running back that got a carry was Duke, and that was on the last drive of the game um, in, in the red zone. Uh, so I, uh, Will Johnson playing so much 
Uh, I, I didn't know. Uh, you knew he was in the two deep. I didn't, and you knew they were going to rotate linebackers to a certain extent. But did, what kind of rotation was it going to be? I anticipated it being more of a three-man rotation with, with like uh, Tisdale playing both Will and Mike and them having a three-man rotation. So that surprised me a little bit. But other than that, no, nah, I can't really think of anything that surprised me. I was surprised to see a 12-play, 83-yard scoring drive out of a guy <laughs> that threw five passes last year at Fordham. I mean, that was kind yeah. of impressive. Um, I was surprised to see that. I, I thought uh, Kevin Decker, the Old Dominion offensive coordinator, played that game about as well as you could. I, th- I think he understood very well ODU's weaknesses and how they could not match up with Tech's corners and how they probably weren't going to be able to pass block when the Hokies knew they were going to pass. So he really tried to uh, shorten the game, uh, run it, and, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for those three turnovers, that uh, they would have been, they could have been right there, right there in it. So I, I think, I think their uh, their game plan was was very sound, but they just didn't quite have the personnel to pull it off. I do like that argument. If it weren't for the three mistakes, uh-huh. man, it's like, well, they yep. happened. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm glad glad to be saying it that way this year instead of the other way around. <laughs> uh, where do you feel like the most realistic improvement might be for Virginia Tech from week one to week two? realistic improvement i i i think i trust the tech defensive coaches to get the run defense fixed more so than i do the uh, offensive staff to get the running game fixed just based on the past like brent prize had always had good defenses uh generally speaking the run defense was pretty good last year although losing dax that Dax was a huge part of that. He was very good against the run last year, so that's a little bit of a question mark. But, you know, the running game was never good at any point last season, and as Brent Pry said, it was too easy to draw a beat on and at times too vanilla, and those are his words, not not mine. And then we saw some more of the same things like that in the first game this year. So I would be more confident in saying the run defense gets fixed than I would be saying the running game on offense gets cranked up. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, we've seen it on defense before and coming into the year the o-line was my biggest question mark for this offense and it kind of you know played out that way Mm -hmm. in the opener it's like are they going to be able to move people off the ball that's what it's about moving people off the ball because i think they have the running backs to to gain yards if they can get some holes there and uh you know perhaps with the success in the air now you've put it on film and other other defenses have to be like, okay, we have to respect this. Maybe drop a few guys back, more back in coverage, and that creates more favorable running situations. Uh, we'll see, but uh, I, I I do have more trust in the defense and the personnel they have there than the offensive side. Anything else from you, David? I'm good. You're good. All right, before I let you guys go, what's coming up this week on TechSideline.com? Man, we're well into game week now. Uh, Will, I guess we'll have a Monday thoughts today. He said he's doing that. He's smoking a brisket. At and the he's same doing time. His, S, his article at home. That's yeah. uh, a full man of many talents. Right there. It really <laughs> is. Um, uh, you know, typical typical game week. You know, we'll have Brandon Patterson. Uh, I guess they'll have media opportunities tomorrow and Wednesday. We'll have our... Uh, have our game preview and podcast on Thursday and various other things throughout the week. So we're in the full swing now, man. I'm in like midseason forum now. I've been two tailgates, <laughs> That's two dangerous. football games, two countries in seven days. I'm, I'm right in the middle of it. Yeah. And I've covered one football game, so I feel like it's football season. It's definitely football season. I feel season. lazy compared to, to Chris over here in his uh, <laughs> travels. Can we just say it was fantastic weather on Saturday? It was it was really good. It was really good. A little hot, a little hot. I, I remembered my sunscreen, and I'm really glad for that. Yep. Awesome. All right, well, we got another one coming up. Thursday, we're going to talk about Purdue. Virginia Tech will play the Boilermakers noon kickoff inside Lane Stadium on Saturday. But for our producer, Nick Brown, fourth chairman, David Cunningham, Andy Bitter, Chris Coleman, I'm Giovanni Heater saying so long. Once again, this was episode 308 of the Tech Sideline podcast. We'll see you later on this week.